<laughs> How do I make that a Grammarica mug? Well, I need I guess an I just have to send, Grammarica mug. I guess I just have to send you one. This is a Spearhead Paso Robles, California mug. Nice. Great. Yeah, you're sounding uh, like a boss. Now, which one's uh, there? We go. So it's that one and that one. We're gonna go back and forth between left or right. One or two or two or three. Ah. You get it? It's like the eye doctor. Yeah. So when did your book come out, David? Just recently? Yeah. April twenty eighth. Oh, was it that long ago? Wow. Okay. Yeah. Mind you, made. I haven't really. A couple uh, months ago, yeah. Things have been so crazy. I haven't really been on any podcast to promote it yet. I wanted to go on Gramerica first. Oh, thanks, buddy. Yeah. Well, we were supposed to be, you know, in person doing. I a, know we we're supposed to be in Bryce Canyon con, by yeah. now. <laughs> so weird, and I just heard. I heard that the borders were closing again or something. I haven't talked to Darren about it yet, but I feel like things are getting worse again. It's crazy. It does seem it's like craziness. it's getting worse again down there. Yeah. Things are getting crazy. We've got events planned for September. And I don't know, I'm starting to worry. End October. End October. I know. I'm supposed to go to both of those. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. Should we get to it? I'm ready. Let's do it. Ready to rock. Are we uh, are we live on the yeah we're live YouTube now. yeah All right. we're live we can see your face on like six different screens in here right now it's like we're surrounded <laughs> by Dave Matheson <laughs> Dave Matrix well <laughs> hello Grimerica I want to say hello to everyone watching at home around the world hello welcome look at look at Graham and Darren I have not been to Grimerica in probably a year. Has it been that I'm, long? Wow. I probably haven't been to the igloo in a year. Well, because like we were saying, we're supposed to meet with you in Bryce Canyon and do the under the stars, like have a real, you know, star myth, myths of the world under the stars. I mean, that would have been amazing. Which we will. But <laughs> yeah, we will. Been. But, we're still going to do it in October. Yeah. It'll just be fall instead of spring. All right, Graham, bring us in, buddy. All right. Welcome back to the show, David Matheson. It's been a while. Dave's Thank been you. studying the world's Great myths and scriptures and sacred stories and kind of coming up with a celestial metaphor in his latest book, Myth and Trauma, how appropriately titled for this uh, 2020, Higher Self, Ancient Wisdom and Their Enemies. So thanks for uh, writing another tome, David, and coming on the show. Thanks for having me. This is like we were saying just before, a minute ago, this is the first podcast i've been on since the book was published so i'm oh, wow. excited to talk about it with you guys we can i've got a little slideshow presentation but we can really go where, whichever direction you guys want to go i sent one to you over a week ago but because everything is slower in the mail it is still making its way up to gray america it sounds like as the last time i checked was yesterday i'm assuming they're not really moving too far today i'm expecting to get it tomorrow actually yeah, right on. But anyway, we can, uh, I've got like a little presentation we can talk about, but uh, how have you guys been? What, what, uh, what, what's on your mind? I listened to a little bit of the previous interview. That was very interesting. Thanks. You mean the one with Bruce, like live yeah, or, I, oh I yeah. Was, I Bruce mean, it was ago. fantastic. Cause he tied, you know, the evolution of us, maybe, you know, ET tweaked along the way 800,000 years ago, but going up to, 70,000 years and then going, getting into like transhumanism and what's going on right now. And, uh, it's, uh, it was really interesting to tie in the contemporary takeover of Western <laughs> society into, into, or, or attempt at a takeover into, uh, you know, our evolution of the past. Yeah. Well, the takeover is not a new phenomenon. No, like that's the <laughs> thing. Exactly. But the more I learn about it, the more I shouldn't be surprised of what's happening, you know? Yeah, it's not, nothing just started in March, but uh, yeah, I didn't get to hear the whole thing, but I heard parts of it. We listened so, on the radio or on the YouTube. I, I I was on the Twitter actually. I just pressed live on oh. on your tweet. Yeah, and it played right within Twitter. 
Oh, wow. What? Yeah. I wonder if we get credit for that view. Maybe we're getting millions of views we don't know yeah, about. Yeah, we're probably getting millions of views on Twitter and it shows like one one like. <laughs> this explains a lot. Anyway, welcome yeah. back to the show, Dave. We wish we would have seen you in April. We'll see you in October. Actually, we'll see you in we're actually going to end up seeing a lot of you this year. We'll see you in September and October. And uh, hey, yeah, you I'm could always come up here in August and we could scope out that spot I've been telling you about where we might do... Uh, we might do like a weird camp and cack sort of thing. Oh, no. Maybe a CE5 yeah. as well. We could, uh, I've been wanting to take Darren out looking for UFOs, man. Well, I was looking at some of the pictures that Darren was sending from his most recent trip out into the, out into the wilderness, and it looked really beautiful. And I said, where is that? Maybe we can see some stars up there. And he said, oh, yeah, you can see millions, millions of stars up here. So maybe sometime in 2021, we'll see. But uh yeah, I'm really looking forward to the September contact at the cabin with Randall. Um, thanks for inviting me to that. I'm looking forward to going to that. And then, as you were mentioning, we have a big Bryce Canyon slash Zion National Park stars over Grimerica event where we're going to be talking about the myths and the stars in person in one of the best stargazing locations in the world at Bryce Canyon and uh, the desert, high desert altitudes. Should I'm hoping it'll be really good stargazing conditions, and uh, we had to reschedule that because it. What was it planned for the middle of April? It's supposed to be April sixteenth to nineteenth. Yeah, it was supposed to be April sixteenth to nineteenth. So around March we realized we had to push it back. So we found a good stargazing window in October. I'm really looking forward to that, and hopefully the national parks will uh, be open. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll have to figure it out. But anyway, I think it's going to work and I'm really looking forward to that. So as long as they open up the imaginary line here in between here and there, then we'll be okay. <laughs> and the Grimerica line is open, right? You guys have opened your borders or not? Oh yeah. Ours are always open. Man. <laughs> always open. <laughs> oh, Grimerica has open borders. <laughs> <laughs> Just big tariffs, high tariffs and open borders. <laughs> high tariffs, really strict customs. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, so we can talk about the new book if you want. Any uh, anything else that's on your mind? Any questions from the <clears throat> chat room? Well, I, I can sh I can share a screen. Whatever you guys want. Yeah, do. I don't know Go if ahead, we want to get into I'm current events in and uh, and and no, what's going on down. Are you in California? You're in California, right? I'm in California. I mean, I don't I'm know. We can stay California. away from that stuff if you want. I mean, it's really all connected. But maybe let's talk about um, individual stuff. Maybe people are tired of talking. Yeah, about that the, sounds good. The yeah, the current events. Yeah. So let's let's, let's talk check about. Out your slideshow and your books. I mean, really everything, all the issues that we deal with, this is when we talk about trauma, this is issues that in, impacts everybody. We live in a trauma inducing society, um, but really even the most cutting edge uh, healers are talking about trauma today. And I'll, I'll mention some quotations, but what I realized when I started hearing some of these uh, physicians and psychologists who are talking about psychological trauma, I realized, wow, this is exactly what the ancient myths, one of the things that the ancient myths are talking about. So the most ancient myths that we have are talking about this very cutting edge and very important to our lives issue of individual trauma or unhealed psychological issues. And, and the myths are helping us pointing our way towards recovery from trauma. And we'll get into what, what that might mean, but uh, even the very earliest myths. So it's not just something that modern society has to deal with if it's talked about in the ancient myths. But I do believe that Societies can be more traumatic or less traumatic. And there is pretty good evidence that there are people who have designed traumatic events to traumatize people on purpose. So our society doesn't have to be as traumatic as it is, and it's getting more traumatic. If you look at the rates of things like depression, anxiety, people taking uh, psychotropic medication to deal with depression and anxiety, those numbers are going up at a very uh, startling rate, which shows that we're, uh, we're having more and more of a traumatic society. And yet it uh, shouldn't be because we're in one of the most safest times. Like things are, things are generally 
you know, in the in Western culture, lifted up at least to the point where things should be less traumatizing. I mean, compared to yeah. like I think about how how people dealt with that in the past, where they were tr- trained as warriors from the age of eight, and they saw their friends die and their families die, and they're constantly under a threat of you know war or whatever. Like how 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 did they handle that? Did they just was that just a part of their you know they the trauma didn't affect them or were they just always traumatized? And yet here we are, you know, should be less traumatized, and yet we're getting that way. Yeah, I mean that's a really really good question, and it's a really it's really interesting the way you framed it, Graham. Because talking about see, let's say you're 21 and you're dealing with traumatic issues. You're you're off to the Trojan War as a Greek warrior or a Trojan warrior. Presumably, if you've been brought up in a cohesive now. I think war is inherently traumatic. Um, and I think if you read the Iliad and the Odyssey, you'll see that it's traumatic. And the ancient myths are talking about healing trauma. But there's a difference between being a well-adjusted adult dealing with painful or chaotic or uh, even physically violent situations and being a infant who is abandoned uh, when you're you're terrified in your crib and your parents have been told, uh, just let him cry it out. That's good for the child to learn to just cry it out and shut up in their crib. See, a, a, an infant can't deal with that the way a grown man or a grown woman can. And, and an infant needs connection from his parents. And really, since parents can't always be available, you've got to have this kind of whole cohesive society. And if you think about hunter-gatherer societies where there's all kinds of uncles and aunts and grandmothers and grandparents around where a child is is very different from, you know, you said, hey, we're living in this nonviolent society where we're not really worried so much about someone coming, coming and cutting off our head with a sword every, you know, week is not a, not a major fear, but we're in a very atomized splintered divided society where kids are uh, away from their parents or parents have to work it's not and it's, it's not lacking connection fault. Right? Yeah. yeah it's lacking connection we've got we've got all these facebook friends or instagram followers or whatever we have but we know that's not the same thing as real connection so we're actually living in a very splintered society where we're looking for um, we're looking for that kind of connection. And if you're not getting that kind of connection as a child, it, it doesn't matter if you were actually physically traumatized, you could be emotionally traumatized. If you're hurting and you're trying to deal with some issue, you're, you're frightened or you're uh, in pain or something, and there's no one there to actually uh, comfort you and let you work through it, then what will happen is you'll divide, you'll, you'll, you'll develop a, a kind of a insulation from the pain and you'll separate from the sensors that are bringing that pain in, which has to do with our whole array of our gut and our uh, subconscious, all these things that are uh, bringing in information to us, we'll start to separate away from them and say, you know, I know you're telling me that I should be frightened right now, but my parents are totally uh, ignoring that. So I guess it's not important. And so you start to divide from it. Anyway, we'll talk that I'm not sure if I'm explaining that perfectly well, but what happens is we divide from ourselves, And that is the heart of trauma as defined by some of these leading edge. I'm not a psychologist. Okay, but when I heard these healers like Dr. Gabor Mate, who I'm quoting, I'll quote a little bit, I quote him a lot in the book, I didn't even discover his work until after my second most recent book, which was The Ancient Worldwide System. But I talk about how the ancient myths are, they always have these sets of twins, and these sets of twins aren't really two different people, it's, it's a division of your own self. And so I was already realizing that the myths were talking about that. And when I started hearing some of these 
cutting edge psychiatrists and, and doctors who are dealing with addiction and seriously traumatized individuals who are trying to um, overcome addiction. And they're talking about it in the same, uh, the same way that the myths are talking. I realized, whoa, this is, there's a real application here that I think is really important. That's largely the genesis of this new book, Myth and Trauma. So I'll show you the, I'll show you the, the cover. I'll share my screen and we'll, and we can talk about it, but hopefully does that, does that trigger any questions or yeah. does that seem to make sense? Yeah. It makes you wonder how, because you hear about the people that have PTSD from kids or from childhood, can they disassociate? I mean, they learn to basically like what you say, separate from yourself or disassociate from your body into the astral realm or a lot of these people have psychic abilities or they can astral travel. Like what does that do? Like the amount of trauma that now are in kids. And it's not like I was saying physical trauma from the threat of war, but it's that different lack of connection. Let's say, I mean, what is it doing to our society that, that, I mean, is there a, is it, is there a, <clears throat> well, yeah, an, un, unintended benefit yeah. that people are, People are learning that this isn't a materialistic world that they live in. Okay, well, that's a good, that's a really interesting question. Good. So I would say that a lot of those things that you're talking about have to do with our higher self, our essential self, our authentic self, and we'll get into that. If yeah, um, yeah. But what trauma does is separate us from our authentic self. Right. When what I love about I mean, one of the things I love about Grand America is you talk about synchronicities and what are synchronicities? Well, I would say that in, uh, in many cases, if not in all cases, certainly in most cases, it has to do with a message from your essential self, your higher self. And your higher self is connected to the universe. So when we get this connected from our higher self, we get disconnected from our connection to the cosmos. So, um, yeah, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but it's a really good question. I mean, Graham, you're already kind of all over it. So, well, because I mean, because there's also the on it. there's also the potential for it to be disastrous with people if people are entering into these other realms through trauma and they don't know how to deal with it, then maybe they're bringing back. Um, entities or energies that uh, are destructive to us and society. You know, there's well, that, there's and that I think well, we have so. those energies inside of ourselves too. I mean, yeah. the, the, the subconscious is not all unicorns and rainbows. Um, so all the gods of the ancient myths, I'm convinced work their way out through men and women. And uh, some of the gods are <laughs> depicted as benevolent and some of the gods are depicted as, malevolent and but when we get disconnected from ourself um, we get disconnected from the whole realm of the universe so let me let me uh let me use a metaphor to try i mean people might be going uh this is kind of interesting but it's kind of way out there i don't know if this really applies to me i've never asked or traveled let me use a metaphor to try and uh set some terms and um so this is myth and trauma it just came out 2020. Can you see the screen now? Yep. Great. Okay. So I want to use um, the myths use these metaphors all the time, but I'm going to use one that's not from an ancient myth, but it's probably more familiar with more viewers right now. And that is from J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. So we all know that there are how many Gandalfs in the Lord of the Rings? There's Any a few, idea what yeah. I'm driving at? Yeah, there's gray and white. Yeah, there's yeah, a couple, but, right? Yeah. So mainly there's two. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't know. I thought, the answer was, I'm looking for I thought maybe two. like, is there more than two? But yeah. 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 So Gan there's Gandalf the gray and Gandalf the white. This is a screenshot from when Gandalf has kind of disappeared from his friends. You remember what happens? Yeah. He goes down yeah. in the mines. In the Balrog, yeah. Yeah, and he, yeah. he has to wrestle with a Balrog. Right. He falls. He says, you know, I fell so far uh, you know down into the depths of the earth i just kept falling out of and then out of, you know, i wrestled to the bottom of the bottomless pit to the top of the highest uh tower and they show him kind of uh 
And then he, at last he smote, he says, I smote my foe at the side of the mountain and I traveled out of all space and time until poof, I came back to you. And now he's a different Gandalf. He's Gandalf the white instead of Gandalf the gray. So there's, there's two Gandalfs, but really it's the same Gandalf. It's just, he's coming, he's, he's in a, di there's a different aspect of Gandalf. Well, anytime you see that in a myth, these two, two different characters, but they're really one character. I would argue that has to do is trying to show us whether Tolkien was doing it consciously or subconsciously. It has to do with a disconnection from our deeper self, our higher self, our essential self from whom we become disconnected. And we have to kind of wrestle with the Balrog to, to get it back, to get back in that connection. Um, the myths talk about that. Uh, there's another character in the Lord of the Rings who has two kind of two aspects in one, one character. Can you Frodo? Frodo's a good guess. <laughs> he's kind of starting to, he's starting to develop a second character, not necessarily a good one, but Boromir? there's one who's like, who's, there's one who's suffered a lot. Yeah. Um, Gollum. I'm thinking, no. yeah, he's got like definitely two personalities cause he's, he's suffered lot of trauma or a lot of disconnection, a lot of loneliness, right? Underneath the mountain, he's down there all by himself. He's, he's, his mind's kind of gotten taken over and there's, and then he has these arguments with himself sometimes. In fact, he's always talking about himself in the second, uh, the third person, the first yeah. person plural, yeah. like yeah, yeah. we or yeah. us, right. it hurts yeah, us, yeah. it hurts us, yeah. right? So the golem character is, so what I'm trying to explain is we have a, we have like a higher self that we've become disconnected from because of trauma. And we have this kind of defense mechanism that we develop because of trauma. And that's the Golem character. There's like the, the sweet the Smeagol character. And then he's totally dominated by this Golem character and the Golem character. Remember when Smeagol says, Hey, master, master helps us. I, we can't strangle him in his sleep, you know? <laughs> and, and then go, the golem character says, nobody likes you. Nobody, <laughs> you know, you're a murderer. I saved us. I'm the one who got us through this. Remember that yep. scene? He says, you know, where would you be without us? Where would you be without me? I saved us. That golem character is a defense mechanism for dealing with the, the pain the trauma of the world. We can talk about different forms of trauma, but actually in the society that we live in, almost everybody experiences some kind of trauma. And it's not because your parents weren't, weren't loving and caring. This is all, I'm repeating the words of Gabor Mate. I'll show you some, uh, Gabor Mate, sorry, I'm uh, pronouncing his name wrong, but uh, Gabor Mate, talks about it's not because your parents didn't love you but it's because of we're in a traumatic society they may have anxiety that gets that you pick up on and you develop a defense mechanism that's like the golem character it's like uh it's like a a tough persona that you that you don't even realize that it's kind of taking over and what it does is it kind of buries the essential self. So this is a quote from Dr. Gabor Mate. And he's, uh, he's a physician who was born in Hungary during World War II, during the, the Holocaust, and he was Jewish. And so he experienced childhood trauma. And then he lives in Canada. So I'm pretty sure he still lives in Canada, but he worked with um, the addicted uh, people who have bad addictions in Vancouver, um, in British Columbia. Yeah. Good book. Very, very high. Yeah. The, the realm, realm of, of hungry, hungry ghosts. ghosts. Yeah. yeah. So he talks about trauma as a lot of people focus on, well, Oh, I didn't have trauma in my childhood or I wasn't sexually abused or emotionally abused, but he explains it's not necessarily certainly there are, those are traumatic and those 
can cause you to disconnect from yourself. But there are all kinds of things that an infant or a one-year-old or a two-year-old or even a young child can experience some kind of societal uh, angst or really, uh, you know, rejection from your friends. And if, if you don't have adults that are there to help you understand it, you can disconnect from who you are or you will without even knowing it. It's a disconnect from you're getting these signals and you're, and they're, they're overwhelming you. You don't have anyone else to help you. You will, as a defense mechanism, disconnect from those signals, from, from where those signals are coming from. And so you'll start to turn off parts of yourself because it's too painful. So the trauma is not the, the things that happen to you. The trauma is what happens inside of you. Not, not the external things, because even if you can, if you're a, a well-adjusted, let's say you grew up in a perfectly loving, uh, let's think of like a, a very tight tribe in the Amazon somewhere where you know exactly who you are as you're growing up. Your father is always with you, taking you on trips into the jungle, teaching you about different plants, um, teaching you how to hunt. You don't have a real uh, question of who you are. You, you're, you're interacting with your peers, but they're not making fun of what you're wearing. There's meaning in their lives, it seems. There's, yeah, and you're very, and, and if your dad has gone on a hunting trip, you've got an uncle who takes you under your wing, or you've got other adults around, and you're very secure in who you are. You may encounter as a 18-year-old or a 21-year-old a dangerous situation. Maybe you're walking through the jungle by yourself, far from everybody else, and you fall off a steep cliff and you're hanging by, a, you know, a vine. But you are in tune with who you are. You're able to tap into a much wider range of of your entire self to get you out of that situation. You're gonna be in a lot better situation than someone who's disconnected from themselves and goes into a panic mode and can't, and has already been cut off from a whole range of uh, who you are, of, of what your body is telling you. Uh, I mean, this is just a, a metaphor I made up on the spot. It's not in the book, but, but I'm trying to answer your question, Graham, that you asked about, you know, back in the ancient times, there was so much more violence in the world. But if you were more connected with who you are, you're more able to handle uh, traumatic or, or painful or chaotic situations as an adult. So it may not even be that the world around us is more uh, difficult than the world of, let's say, the 1920s or the 1930s. But if all the people in that era grew up in a much more, I don't know, uh, supportive kind of childhood, and they're, they just have a much deeper connection to who they are, they're probably able to handle those more things resilient yeah. than today, right? Yeah. And it also, Gabor Mate talks about, if you're a very sensitive person, some people are more sensitive than others. Sensitive, creative uh, children will feel uh, emotional pain more severely than, you know, someone who may not be as sensitive. So it's different for every person, but that trauma that you go through or the, the trauma is the disconnection. It's the reaction to what you went through. So you shouldn't compare, well, I didn't go through something as bad as, you know, my friend who was uh, always beaten by their dad. Uh, my dad never beat me. So my, my situation, you know, you can, the trauma is what's on, on the inside, the disconnection. And that can happen to you even if you grew up in a perfectly loving environment. So um, that is how we disconnect from the essential self. And the, the, we develop this golem persona. Or I, I use the golem character as like a metaphor for this egoic mind, this doubting mind that's always like, oh, should I wear this? People might make fun of me, or I mean, you you develop that as just part of going to elementary school, middle school. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's it's traumatic. Yeah, yeah, and if you don't have 
this like deep sense of who you are, which Jeez. comes from a uh, family, you can, you can unwittingly and unconsciously, as it says here, this is another quotation from Dr. Gabor Mate. If our environment can't support our gut feelings and our emotions, then the child in order to quote, belong and fit in, which we all recognize this because Western society does this, then you're going to suppress your emotions, your connections to yourself for the sake of staying connected to the nurturing environment, without which the child cannot survive. Well, that's a great example, the school, because I was trying to think of what, uh, <clears throat> you know, in ways where we are traumatized or, or the way we deal with these things in the wrong way. And school would be a great example. I mean, that it, everybody has this issue in school for the most part. I mean, most people. I mean, it's it's just a – it seems like an automatic thing that comes along with school. Like I Because I – I think about that a lot because in addiction and alcoholism, trauma is always used as, you know, people go through trauma and there's a, a there's people and like, like myself too, that I don't remember anything super traumatizing, but what you're saying here makes sense that it we've been affected. Almost all of us have been affected to one level or another and of disconnecting and disassociating with ourselves. And Dr. Mate says, if you have an addiction and it doesn't have to be an addiction to a hardcore drug like heroin or opioids or you know crack cocaine but if you have an addiction it could be any kind of a behavior that soothes some pain but has negative consequences yeah and yet despite those negative consequences you can't give it up that's an addiction and he says don't don't first of all, don't look at the, the addiction. Don't look at the negative consequences. First, look at the positive consequences. What is it doing for you? Why did you turn to that in the first place? It's, it's soothing something, yeah. some kind of disconnection. Yeah. It's, it's giving you peace of mind. It's giving you uh, a feeling of being connected. It's giving you a feeling of self-worth or whatever, greater feeling. Those aren't bad things. You're looking for something that you actually need but somehow you weren't able to get that as a child and our society kind of excels at not giving that to you as a child. So therefore we have to look for external things and our whole society is built on giving you these kind of substitutes and our whole economy is based around giving you these kinds of substitutes, but um, it didn't have to be some very, you know, textbook tra traumatic situation like sexual abuse certainly those do dr mate says there's not a woman i dealt with in vancouver who was a, a terrible addict who had very bad addiction who was not uh, sexually abused as a child not one hmm. and he was working in vancouver for 10 years and saw literally hundreds of yeah. people that he tried to help but 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 what i was going to say is the other part is he's he's not the only voice who's talking about this he's a He's one of the leading voices who's talking about this. Peter Levine is talking about this. Other doctors are talking about this. But they still say, for the most part, this is not even taught in medical school. You can go through all the way through medical school, and I'm not a doctor, but you can be go all the way through medical school, school and never even learn about trauma. And so what's amazing to me is the ancient myths are clearly talking about this. Um, I'm not an expert on you know, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a doctor. I am for the past 10 years studying the myths very deeply. And I can tell you for sure, the myths talk about trauma. The whole Adam and Eve story is about trauma and shame. They're, at first, they're naked and they're unashamed. And then they're full of shame and they have to cover themselves. And then the you know, they're, they're, they're accusing each other. Well, he gave me the apple or she gave me the apple. And, oh, well, it wasn't, it wasn't my fault. It was that woman you gave me. And it's all, uh, the, the trauma is and the separation from one another is very clear in that story. The separation from the divine realm is clear in that story. The separation from nature is clear in that story. They get kicked out of Eden. It's a metaphor. It's not literal. And I can prove that it's a metaphor. That's, the connection to the stars that we can talk about later, but it is talking about disconnection. Not only are they disconnected from, they're disconnected from one another. Before they were loving together, 
unashamed, naked. They could see who each other was completely, completely naked and yet unashamed together. And now all of a sudden, they're accusing each other, they're separated from each other, and they're even separated from themselves. They're, they have shame in who they are, and they can't even, uh, and they're disconnected from the divine realm as well. So the myths I can show you from, from uh, myths from ancient Egypt, myths from ancient Mesopotamia, myths from the Americas, they are talking about trauma and how to overcome it. And yet they've been twisted, as you mentioned in the, the subtitle of the book is ancient, uh, higher self, ancient wisdom and their enemies. These myths have been twisted into something that actually, <laughs> I, uh, I laugh, but only in a uh, cynical way, um, not in a joyful way. They've been twisted into something that actually uh, inflicts trauma on people. Uh, you know, oh, original sin, you're going to hell. And, and uh, we have the right to dominate these other cultures that don't believe in this myth or that myth. So they're actually there to help us, but they've been twisted into something that, that actually makes our world more traumatic. So that's what this book's about. What, what are some can, of the, what are some of the other examples then, like the Egypt or the, uh, yeah, we'll get, we, or... I'll show you a couple. Um, yeah. but this is the, uh, yeah, let, let me show you a couple, but this is kind of the picture of the separated self the, uh, that I just created based on this metaphor of the two people uh, that, that are in one person. Now, I know in the Tolkien, it's not Gollum and Gandalf are not one character, but we create this persona, this defense mechanism, and we bury our essential self because our essential self being connected to ourself is too painful. Because our self is telling us, hey, I want you to express, uh, I want to express myself this way. And when you go to school and you get laughed at uh, expressing yourself that way, you're like, okay, I'm going to bury that part of who I right. am. And so um, now I'll show you some myths. Th this is a, a token uh, version of that dynamic going on. But we create this golem persona. And we don't even like the golem persona a lot of times. We're like, why did I say that? Oh, I hate myself. Oh, mm -hmm. I wish I could get rid of, I wish I could get rid of that aspect of me. Just like Smeagol tries to do. He says, go away and never come back. How's that work? <laughs> Doesn't work out at all, right? He's like, he, he tells the golem, go away and never come back. Well, that's not how you get back in touch with your essential self. You can't just destroy this persona. That it was created as a defense mechanism and it doesn't just go away but the myths show how to get back in touch with your essential self over and over they show it so would you, would you say that when you say essential self is that the same as higher self and authentic self yeah i use those terms uh, interchangeably? interchangeably okay higher self even divine self this is a picture of castor and pollux from the greek myths this is actually from a ancient uh, bowl, ancient pottery bowl. I just um, used some photo editing to put it in front of some stars. But those are the two twins, the Gemini twins of Castor and Pollux. And one of them, if you know the myth, you realize that one of them is actually mortal and one of them is actually divine. So I'm, I'm answering your question, Graham. It could be called the divine self sometimes. It could be called the higher self. I know you're familiar with some of the Eastern traditions where they talk about Atman. Have you heard of Atman and yeah. Brahman? And, and there's a saying in one of the Upanishads that says, Brahman is all and Atman is Brahman, which means, and I may not be pronouncing those exactly perfectly, like people go to school for decades of their life to learn Sanskrit and the right pronunciation. So apologies if I butchered any of the pronunciation, but Higher self is sometimes called Atman, or it's spelled like Atman, A-T-M-A-N. And it's we each have this higher self, and yet it's connected to the whole universe. Brahman is all. The divine is everything. And yet Atman is Brahman. So there's a, a piece of the universe in the higher self, or the essential self is connected to the cosmos and that's how you hear the voice of the gods or that's how you get that message 
that some of your some of your listeners have sent in synchronicities where they've said, I just got this feeling to step on the brakes. And if I hadn't, that truck would have just T-boned me. Well, where did you get that little voice? It's tied in. There are, there are examples where people have gotten a message where you could say, okay, it's your subconscious was, you know, your deep subconscious was able to maybe hear that truck approaching your conscious mind, your golem mind that was thinking about, uh, do I look good for this date that I'm on my way to? Is my hair okay? And did I wear the right shoes? It's not paying attention, but your deeper subconscious may have heard that truck and giving you, realizing that you're about to get uh, just splattered on the pavement, told you, don't go right now, step on the brakes. So we could explain that with the subconscious, but there are people who have gotten messages that can't even be explained by the subconscious where they got a message from like about a friend who's in a totally different uh, part of the country, you know, thousands of miles away. And they, they pick up the phone and, and call and they're like, how did you know to call me? Your, your higher self is tapped into something even bigger than your subconscious. But, but I would say you can call it your higher self, your essential self, your authentic self. If you're disconnected from your authentic self, you're not able to hear the voice of the universe as, as well, I think. Yeah. And I think so, it's important to know there's ways to, to get connected too. Like we had, uh, you know, a, a guest, Eric P. Anthony, who wrote this book called Song of the Immortal Beloved on Spiritual Alchemy. And he puts in, in there his meditations on actually how to do that. And if you do that a little bit, you can focus on these different emotional events in your, in your past and then focus on a part of uh, one of the centers of your body and you go from center to center focusing on different emotions and start trying to feel how it, it is in those centers. And <clears throat> as you begin to realize how the different emotions feel, the, the false self starts to peel away really. And, and what you're left with is your authentic self. So it is, there is a, you know, a, a real difference when you start working on, on that. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think there are ancient disciplines and, you know, the, the, the method that you just explained of getting in touch, like listening to different parts of your body and, and those centers that we're just basically covered with sensors. Our gut is like a, a gigantic, you know, 10,000 sensors, but a lot of times we don't listen to our gut or we're like, oh, be quiet. But it's because as a child, if let's say we were terrified and our gut was sending us all this danger signals and yet somehow our parents minimized it or said hey don't cry or whatever or or just left us alone and didn't allow us to work through you and start integrate those it, yeah. you start yeah. to support you say okay yeah. i mean with, you don't say it consciously but unconsciously this happens to where the golem mind says man i keep getting hurt i'm gonna have to shut off that part the golem persona is created through trauma it's it's a that's why gandalf even says to frodo at one point you have to have compassion on golem he got that way because of basically you know pain that could happen to uh, uh, unresolved pain that could happen to anybody but so anyway back to these two characters here the the two youths of zeus they're sometimes called Castor and Pollux. One of them is human, mortal. One of them is divine. And that is a pattern that we find over and over in the myths. And so what I would argue is when you see that, it's not talking about two different people. That is talking about telling you, you have two aspects to who you are. And so we find twins in myth after myth after myth around the world. And it's talking about, we have a mortal self and we have a divine self and a lot of times these stories have to do with going down to the underworld in fact in the castor and pollux castor dies and pollux his greek name is polydeuces goes to zeus and says father because zeus is their father i can't live without my brother and zeus says you know well i'll give you a choice you can you can uh, be immortal all the time and dwell here in Olympus with me, or you can spend half the time down there in, in the uh, underworld and bring your, bring your brother up to the mortal world, but you'll have to, you'll have to go through death 
but half the time he'll get to come up to Olympus. So it's, it's talking about our, our higher self is uh, raising our mortal self, but uh, it, it involves going down into the darkness. And I think a lot of that has to do with meditation or one it, it's down inside of ourself. That's where you find your higher self. That's where you get reconnected. I'll just uh, whip through. You can go ahead and respond to that. I'll whip through a few more. This is actually an ancient Mesopotamian uh, carving. And some people believe, and it probably is, uh, that it's Gilgamesh and Enkidu battling with Humbaba. Hmm. Remember how, uh, remember how uh, Gandalf had to fight the Balrog? Gilgamesh and Enkidu wrestle with Humbaba. Um, that, that pattern is found over and over in, in myths as well. So Gilgamesh and Enkidu are these two heroes that are so alike that everybody, whenever they see them, says, wow, Enkidu looks just like Gilgamesh, except he's covered with hair. Gilgamesh is two-thirds divine. Enkidu is actually a wild man who is, at first, he's covered with hair and lives with the animals of the field. So it's the same pattern of kind of semi-divine and mortal. And actually, uh, in that myth, also Enkidu has to go down to the underworld and Gilgamesh just kind of loses it. It's the same. He mourns for his other half that has to go down to the underworld. Is he not supposed to turn around and look or something? And he does. Is that the same? Uh, that's a different one. But oh, that's, that's, a, a, that's, yeah, yeah. that's a great pattern. That's yeah. a that's a huge myth pattern. That's the Orpheus myth that yeah, you're right, thinking right. of. Yeah. But actually, that pattern is found around the world. It's not just in Orpheus. Orpheus and Eurydice is in ancient Greece. That is found across North America. And all the Native American nations have a an Orpheus type of a story and uh japan there's an orpheus myth where he can't look back and of course he does um so that i think that is related to this story so that's a great great uh great thought graham on that one and actually i've got some slides later on they're just like in reserve in case we talk about different things i've got an orpheus slide that we can look at but these are uh speaking of the americas these are some twins in the myths of the Maya. So this is from Central America. The twins, their names are Hunapu and Ishbalanke. Uh, they go down to the underworld as well, and they have to, uh, they have to undergo these ordeals in the underworld and, and pass all these different challenges that the, the lords of the underworld throw at them. But it's, a, it's the same pattern that we're finding around the world, these twin pattern myths that I would argue are teaching us the same thing that I was trying to explain using Golem and Gandalf a little, little bit ago. This is, a, this is the engraving of, this is a biblical story. I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, two twins and one of them is, is giving away his birthright for a mess of pottage for that, that bowl that's in his hand there. He's saying, okay, you give me the soup, uh, you give me the, the meat stew, I'll give you the birthright. Do you know that story? No. It's Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau. And interestingly, in the Jacob and Esau story, Esau is described as being covered with hair, just like Enkidu hmm. in the Gilgamesh story. So it's another twin pattern myth that's dealing with the same pattern that we're finding around the world. This is actually probably can guess which hero that is on the left he's got a lion's kind of skin over his head and you can see it on around his waist and he's fighting this monster with multiple heads that's the famous hero from ancient greece come on he fights the hydra i was gonna say hydra hercules yeah that's hercules <laughs> we we know him mostly by his roman name hercules in ancient greece his name was heracles we don't really know um, it's not as widely known, but Heracles is also a twin. Just like in the twin story of Castor and Pollux, Heracles has a divine father and uh, a mortal mother. Okay, You can think of another figure from the Bible who has a divine father but a mortal mother. You might get Jesus. That <laughs> That's right. But two for two. actually, in most of these sets of twins, 
the mortal father actually sleeps with the mother after Zeus has visited because Zeus doesn't want to be, uh, you know, doesn't want to be found out as having all these affairs. So he lets the mortal father <laughs> come in later. And so usually there's a set of twins. But one of the twins is the son of Zeus by the mother. And then the other twin is the son of the ordinary father, who's usually a king, but he's mortal. He's not Zeus. So in the case of uh, the divine twins, Castor and Pollux, Zeus comes down and uh, has an affair with this queen of Sparta. Her, uh, her name is Leda. And, uh, and, and then later that night, the king uh, comes, comes back and sleeps with his wife. And then so there's two sons. Castor is the son of Zeus. And, and the queen, and uh, sorry, Pollux, Polydeuces is the divine one, and Castor is the mortal one. Same thing with Hercules. He has a brother named Iphicles. Iphicles is the son of the king and the queen. Hercules is the son of the queen and Zeus on the same night. So that's why they're twins, but one's mortal, one's, but the whole, I mean, the whole, the whole reason for that complicated story is to have a mortal and a divine twin, and it's a picture of us. We have a mortal aspect and a divine aspect, but we forget the divine aspect. We don't even, we're not even aware that we have a higher self. If you talk to people and say, oh, your higher self, they'll go, what are you talking about? Don't give me that higher self stuff. What have you been doing too much yoga? I mean, I don't have a higher self. Yes, you do. You have an authentic self that you separated from. Remember that that quote from Dr. Mate. He said, without even knowing it, you'll suppress who you are. You don't even know about your higher self. That's why these myths are there to try and teach you that you have a higher self. Hmm. So is even... it like a three-way then? <laughs> You're getting back to the, the details of the story. <laughs> <laughs> They're not all there together. <laughs> Zeus takes off and then he lets the king come back. Does that sure. answer your question? <laughs> Does that answer your question, Darren? Um, <laughs> well, the gods work their way out through mortal men and women. I actually think the gods um, work their way out through people. So they are not in the physical realm. They're in the spiritual realm, but... Um, I'm just going to move on from that, that comment that you made, Darren. That's a good. It's a good question. Um, you can go to the myths yourself. I'm, I'm trying to point people to the myths. If you go to the myths, you can figure. You can. There may be lessons in there, that, you know, I haven't, haven't brought out. I'm not. I'm not the interpreter of the myths. I'm pointing people to the myths. But I'm telling you, these myths will. We're, I believe we're designed to help you recover your authentic self. Uh, I'm not, I can't help, I can't recover anybody else's authentic self. The only authentic self that I can recover is my authentic self. You, nobody else can recover your authentic self for you. I can't, no one else can, but I think the myths are a tremendous uh, resource to help you do that. So I don't have the, I don't have the definitive interpretation of any of these. Um, I'm just telling you what I, I've, uh, the way I'm interpreting them based on uh, looking at them for a long time and realizing that they're star myths. Uh, let's see a couple more. So all of those have been male, but we have, there are, there are female twins. There are female, um, there are female characters that, that, play the play out this same story to try and help us get back in touch with our higher self this is a statue it's from a uh, famous sculptor named or his nickname was canova but this is a statue depicting the reunion of eros and psyche eros and psyche mm. psyche is the the woman well you can tell right there by her name this this is an ancient story. This is an ancient myth, Eros and Psyche. You can tell by her name that she has something to do with that self that I've been talking about. In this case, I would say she has to do with the doubting egoic mind, the psyche that's been created, this, the egoic self, the persona that we develop 
due to having to deal with society that she wants to get back in touch with Eros, the powerful, this powerful God that is her lover, but she doubts him. She doubts him and she loses him in this story. Uh, in the story, she's, she's the most beautiful woman in the world, but uh, her parents say, oh, she's more beautiful than the goddess of beauty. That's always a recipe for disaster. Uh, so the goddess of the real goddess of beauty, Aphrodite or Venus, uh, sends all kinds of terrible calamities on the on the country for you know claiming that a mortal daughter is more beautiful than the source of all beauty <laughs> and so they send her away but eros who has fallen in love with her and who's actually the son of aphrodite um, rescues her and takes her to a beautiful palace it's like a lot of fairy tales where she's in this beautiful palace but she she's waited on by all these invisible servants that she never sees. She goes to bed at night and then uh, an invisible husband comes and makes love to her. But he says, listen, you know, when the lights are all out and he says, listen, you can't ever turn the lights on while I'm here. You can't ever see who I am. And after a while, she starts to have doubts in her mind. Like, I don't know who this really is. Everything is wonderful. He's always kind to me. He says he's a God, but she's, she's like, I'm, I'm lonely. I want my sisters to come visit. So her sisters come visit. They become jealous at this palace she's living in. They start to say, well, when do we get to meet your husband? And she says, well, you can't really meet your husband. He says no one can uh, be allowed to see him. And they go, oh, he must be a monster. He must be a giant serpent with wings. He must be a slimy worm. He must be, you know, horrible. Why don't you, uh, <laughs> why don't you hide a, a, a lamp? And after he falls asleep, after you make love and he falls asleep, light the lamp and see what he really looks like and you'll find out you're probably married to a hideous you know troll or something and the sisters go away and the doubts keep nagging at her keep nagging at her and finally she she carries out the plan and and lights the lamp after he's fallen asleep and sees oh it's the most beautiful handsome you know god of love eros and a drop from the a drop from the lamp of course falls on his shoulder he wakes up and says why did you doubt me? That's it. And he flies out the window and she's, she's alone. Never uh, gets to see him again. Sounds like he was a bit of a booty caller anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Darren. This is a metaphor. So uh, she had, she has lost her higher self. She's lost connection to her, to her divine self, the divine aspect through doubt and so she has to go on this big search to try and reconnect and eventually she does just like in the gandalf scene she basically dies and then he revives her with a kiss and so this statue is actually called eros reviving psyche with the kiss of love huh. and that's in the ancient myth so and, and you see that in fairy tales over and over like sleeping beauty or whatever uh, snow white but it is this pattern is you have to look for your divine higher self because you've lost it, not necessarily through any fault of your own, just through the human, human life, uh, what you go through in life, you develop doubts. Why do you develop doubts? To keep from getting hurt. Why did the golem persona develop? He's trying to protect and survive in the miserable situation that he's in. So we develop doubts to keep ourselves from getting burned, to keep ourselves from, from harm. And yet those doubts that we've developed to keep us from harm, the, the, that persona, that psyche that we develop s separates us from our true powerful nature. It keeps us, holds us back from what we could attain. We self-sabotage ourselves. We get into addictions uh, because we're trying to soothe but we realize I'm, I'm sabotaging. I'm, I'm not being who I could be. You've got to reconnect with who you really are. And that's what this story is talking about, but it's not easy. Psyche has to like wander all over the place, trying to find her lost lover. Same thing in the Osiris myth. Isis has to search all over the earth to try and find the buried slain God Osiris. It's a similar pattern. Hmm. So 
uh, and it's actually, it, I would argue, and I spend some time on this in a number of my books, but also in this one, the, the, this is the scene of, do you know this famous scene, this famous episode from the Gospels? No. Remember, Psyche lost Eros because of her her lamp doubts. oil. Yeah, her <laughs> lamp <laughs> oil. Right. Because, but why was she using the lamp? Yeah, because she doubted. She was overcome by doubt. So this is the story of doubt. doubting, doubting Jesus. Thomas. Thomas. Doubting Thomas. Very good, Graham. Graham gets Ooh. a star. Isn't that a racist? Star, Darren. <laughs> what a star. Oh, that's Uncle Tom. <laughs> Uh, come on, man. <laughs> Can you edit that part out of the live feed? Which part? Uh, this is Doubting Thomas. So yeah, but people who are named after Thomas are named after, this is, the Thomas is actually, his, he's called in the Gospels, Thomas the Twin. Thomas hmm. the Twin, which matches right up with the twin patterns that we've been talking about. So He's actually a very, very important figure because he represents us and how we reconnect with our higher self, our divine self. What keeps us back from our divine self is doubts, all these defense mechanisms that, we're, that have been created because of trauma, um, all these even subconscious, uh, we're not even aware of them, but, but he's he he's told oh you know we've seen the risen lord and he says oh i'm not going to believe that well why does he say that because he's been burned too many times he's afraid to he's afraid to believe he's afraid to love this is all based on the exact same pattern of the divine twin and the mortal twin and in fact there's there are some gnostic gospels that didn't that got excluded from the canon and one of those Jesus says to Thomas, Jesus is always having dialogues with Thomas. He says, Thomas, I don't want you to be ignorant of who you are. There are many people who don't even know of the divine nature. He says, Thomas, let me explain to you. I am your twin. You're my twin. So it's like I was saying, a lot of people don't even realize they have a higher self. Or if you start talking about the higher self, the essential self, the authentic self, their golem mind will laugh at you because it's like, ha, 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 ha. I don't want to hear about that. Hmm. I don't want to believe that I've been divided from who I am. It's too painful. The golem self wants to suppress the authentic self because the golem self got divided from the authentic self because of trauma. Being connected to the authentic self was painful for some reason. So the, the, the egoic mind wants to deny that there's even such thing as a higher self and you see that in the story hmm. of of doubting thomas so so that's uh I, you were asking i think graham you said can you show some myths that talk about that well so I, yeah actually well i do have a question before i forget it, um the have you ever looked into have you heard of the myths of um dionysos and bacchus who were resurrected on march 25th both of them and does that have anything to do with this trauma at all yeah so dionysus is a super important god and bacchus is is the uh roman that's the name is used more in roman but it's the same god but you're right there are actually there's there's actually um uh, there's a, a a dionysus who is burned up there, Dionysus goes through not just one resurrection, but actually two different resurrections. Okay, he's, he's torn limb from limb by uh, his brothers. He's the the name Dionysus. It's really interesting. Actually, means Zeus, Dios of Nysos, Nysos, the mountain okay. of Nysos. Yeah. So Dionysus is the Zeus of the mountain of Nysos, and Dionysus is actually the son of Zeus. But um, once again, it's not. Zeus is married to the goddess Hera. That's his main consort. That's his main wife, if you will. But he's always having affairs. And so in, uh, in, in the birth of, of Dionysus, it's the, uh, the beautiful Semele or Semele. Um, Zeus becomes enamored with her and, 
And so they have an affair. And then she says, hey, I want to see you in all your glory. Can I see you in all your glory, please? And there's actually a parallel to this in the Bible where Moses asked to see God in all his glory. But um, Zeus says, that would be a bad idea. You cannot see me in all my glory. It'll burn you up. And she goes, no, I insist. Actually, I think Hera, um, in the story, Hera finds out about the affair, goes to Semele and says, hey, is it true that you're with child by Zeus himself, the very god of the thunderbolt? Is that true? And Semele says, yes, the the child I carry inside me is going to be the son of Zeus. And Hera in disguise says, I don't think that's possible that he's really Zeus. Another, the doubt motif is there again. Why don't you ask him to show himself in all his divine glory as the, the Lord of Olympus? Why don't you ask him to show, show, him in that, show himself in that form? Then you'll know for sure if you're really married to Zeus. And Simone goes, okay, <laughs> I didn't think of that. And so she starts pestering Zeus and saying, you know, I'm wondering if you could show me yourself in your true glory. And he says, bad idea. Don't ask that. You couldn't, you couldn't handle it. But the doubt has taken over her mind, and she says, come on, I, re- I want to know if you're really Zeus. And he says, listen, I'm really Zeus. <laughs> and she says, I don't believe it until I see it. And he, So he chooses like the smallest possible thundercloud and the smallest possible lightning bolt, and he shows himself in all his glory, and she's immediately burned to ashes. And the child inside of her uh, would have been burned to ashes, but he's the divine Dionysus. So that's like his first... Um, resurrection kind first of death yeah. yeah and zeus actually sows dionysus inside of his own thigh and then dionysus is born uh, a- after the full nine months is born out of zeus's thigh which is wow which is interesting and it has a celestial component it's all this is all celestial yeah um, as well so then the titans are i think are the ones who are jealous of him next and they tear him limb from limb which has to do with the constellation that he's associated with. And then he's resurrected again. So Dionysus has uh, definite patterns that have some similarities to Jesus. And actually, if you look at depictions of Dionysus, he typically has the flowing hair and beard and um, youthful looks. And he's a god of wine. And Jesus turns water to wine. There's there's a lot of parallels throughout all the uh, myths of the ancient world. But I don't know if that addresses your question. Yeah, yeah, or not. yeah, yeah. What about Bacchus? Yeah. Well, so Bacchus is the the Roman name. There's actually a name for the uh, Dionysus before he gets torn limb from limb, and then he becomes Dionysus. And I can't remember what that name is off the top of my head. I think it starts with a Z. But um, Bacchus is another name for Dionysus. Oh, okay, okay. Um, but because he but keeps there coming are different Bacchus. aspects. Yeah, <laughs> good one. I give that one a, a 7.2. Um, mm. the, uh, the, uh, there are different aspects of Dionysus, like as a jolly kind of really drunk, you know, not, not as youthful looking, more corpulent. That's how Bacchus is often depicted. So um, like jolly Bacchus riding on a donkey a lot of times. Um, hanging out with satyrs who are yeah, yeah. right so uh in that aspect of that so dionysus has a lot of different aspects in fact in one aspect he's even horned dionysus is almost like a head on top of a, a river uh serpent um and in, in, in that way he's actually associated with moses because wow. moses is sometimes depicted with horns so uh yeah dionysus is a super important god i mean he's the zeus of the mountain nisus so you know that he's a he's an extremely important he's an extremely important god if he's a zeus right he's dios the same word dios that we get the same word dios that is the word for god in spanish is the same word as is in the name dionysus or dios nisos and it's related to the name Zeus. Dios, if you t- turn the D into kind of a Z, it becomes Zeus. Zeus. Yeah, yeah. A and Zeus is real close to Jesus, too. That's right. It's it's also close to uh, the divine name of God in the in the Bible, uh, Jehovah. Yeah. Jove. Jove, uh, which is 
Zeus Pater or Jupiter is the is the Latin name, which is also Jove, which is related to Jehovah or Yahweh. Yahweh with a the W could be pronounced as a V. That Yo Yahweh is very close to Jove as well. So um, actually, all these most powerful divine figures are related to the same constellations across the myth systems. What about Adonis? Same kind of question for Adonis. Yeah, so Adonis actually uh, is, uh, uh, I think, associated with a different constellation, Sagittarius. Uh, he's a he's a shepherd. Um, I don't have any. I've got some pictures. So let me actually Zeus is associated with Hercules, and I've shown this a little bit before. But how are we doing on time? What, what how long have you been going? Uh, about an hour and a half, I think. So far, yeah, a little so, bit less. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've been talking a lot about how these myths are actually metaphors for what we're going through. Okay, I'm not saying that the these gods are not real. I believe they're very real. I believe the divine realm is very real. And I believe we reconnect with it or we connect with it through our higher self. Um, so uh, I believe you can find these kinds of uh, ways back to connect with who you really are through the scriptures of the Bible, through the scriptures of the Vedas and the sacred texts of ancient India, through the myths of, of that were given to all the different cultures of the world. Um, I don't believe that they're not real, but I am convinced that they're based on celestial metaphor because the stars are in this infinite realm. So they use the stars to teach us about the invisible realm. Like if I said, hey, what is what does my higher self look like? You know, if I was talking to a, a wise guru who's going to teach me how to reconnect with my higher self, and I go up to the top of the mountain, and he starts teaching me to meditate. And one day I say, hey, you know, so I can recognize my higher self. What does he look like? Or she look like? Or what does my higher self look like? The, the, the teacher would probably slap me and say, you knucklehead, you're looking in the wrong direction. Your higher <laughs> self is not a physical entity and i say yeah but but wait my higher self sometimes is portrayed as isis or as osiris or as uh jesus or as yeah but that's to teach you how to reconnect with your higher self oh does that mean that uh the divine realm isn't real you'd probably slap me again and say no of course not the divine realm is real you just can't see it so the way i'm going to help you understand it is through these myths are going to point you towards these are realities, but they're using the infinite realm of the stars to teach us those realities. And it can be proven to be a metaphor because all of these myths are can be shown to be based on the stars. So I've shown some connections to Hercules before, but it's good because we were just talking about Zeus and the connection to other divine figures that are very powerful. Um, this is Hercules again. Can you, and I've, I, I think I've shown this on Gramerica before, but just for people that maybe this is their first time seeing me talk and hopefully, you know, they might say, oh, that metaphor stuff is very interesting, but how do you know it's, how do you know it's really that? Well, I can show you that these myths are based on the stars. They are using celestial metaphor. And here's an outline of Hercules from, or Heracles from an ancient Greek uh, pottery. He's fighting in a battle here. You can see he's got his arm up over his head. You can see a sword way up there. If you look, the, the pot that it's painted on is curved, but he's got this huge sword over his head. He's got one leg forward and one leg back, one arm forward. And if you look at the outline of Hercules that I put up there, that's the constellation Hercules. The hero Heracles is almost invariably drawn in that outline, that same, that same posture that matches up with the constellations. Here's, here's a, this is a different myth where Heracles or Hercules is stealing, he's actually stealing the tripod from the temple of Delphi. <laughs> 
And you can see that exaggerated lunge again. You see that exaggerated lunge in his, his, uh, his posture. He's actually being chased by the god Apollo. Apollo, you can see he's got a quiver of arrows at his side. That's Apollo is related to a different constellation, actually Sagittarius, that, that you asked about, mm. Graham, when you were asking about Adonis. Yeah. Um, Adonis, all these constellations can play a male character or a female character. Sagittarius plays female characters a lot of times and a lot of times plays male characters. So Adonis is kind of a, um, you know, a youth who's got a lot of physical beauty not like rugged looking like Hercules and um, a lot of times doesn't have a beard. So you see Apollo. So um, Adonis sometimes actually gets castrated in some of the myths by a boar or, um, you know, the, 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 the stories when you're like, what, what is going on in these stories? They seem so, uh, they seem so bizarre. Zeus sews up a baby, Dionysus in his leg and then gives birth to him. That's because Dionysus is associated with the constellation that's right below Heracles, Ophiuchus. That's how he gets torn limb from limb. You can see the, the serpent halves on either side. Um, huh. he, he's born from the thigh of Zeus or Athena is born out of the head of Zeus. Athena is also associated with Ophiuchus. But in this case, Hercules is running off with a tripod at the temple of Delphi, what do you think constellation could play the tripod that Hercules is trying to run away with? It's actually <sighs> Ophiuchus right there. It's, it's Ophiuchus right below. Is that what, see, what's Ophiuchus stepping on? He's stepping on Scorpio, and that plays a role in a lot of myths. But actually, um, to the left of Ophiuchus is Sagittarius. Sagittarius is on the other side of the Milky Way from Scorpio. That's... Um, Apollo is associated with Sagittarius. I didn't draw it in on this one. I should have, but the tripod of Ophiuchus in this case is in between Hercules, the constellation, and Sagittarius, the constellation. And that's why we have this myth of Hercules and Apollo having a tug of war over the tripod of the temple at Delphi. I think it looks, it could be interpreted as looking like a tripod. It, Ophiuchus plays a role of a lot of different uh, figures and myth. Some, sometimes it's a mountain. That's why it's Zeus of the mountain or Dionysus is associated with Ophiuchus. Go is there ahead, something please. else about him taking the oracle away from that? Or is that tripod something to do with yeah, the tripod future is telling? The oracle. Or, oh, yeah, is it? Okay. that's right. And yeah. it's right there next to the Milky Way. You can see kind of some smoky stuff on the left side of the... Uh, left side of that constellation yeah, image yeah, there, yeah. that's the Milky Way. I've inverted the sky so that the background of the sky, which would be dark, is light. And everything that's uh, everything on this image is inverted. So the Milky Way, which is really bright in the sky, looks like cloudy smoke. So that's the smoke that floats up next to the tripod that puts the priestess, her name is the, the, the Pythia. Uh, she's, she's the priestess of Delphi. She's uh, the, the smoke is rising up from the body of Python that Apollo s slew the dragon Python. The dragon Python is almost certainly associated with Scorpio that's down there beneath the tripod. Huh. Does that make sense? Yep. But what I'm really trying to show is I, I'm getting, uh, getting off into some other myths, but I'm really trying to show the connection between Hercules and the constellation Hercules. You can see the artist using those same uh, constellation patterns in the art. Here's Zeus. So Zeus is the father of Hercules. This is an, uh, an ancient vase showing Zeus. He's got his arm raised overhead with the uh, thunderbolt. He's about to battle with Typhon. Typhon is, on, is to the right. But since it's a little bit damaged, it's hard to tell. But if you look, he's in that same deep lunging posture. But some of the paint has flaked off. But can you see how his back leg is bent mm -hmm. off to the left of your screen there? Yeah. Here's a depiction of what it used to look like. Wow. Can you see that that's the same posture as the constellation Hercules? It's got quite the bubble butt there. Yeah, he's, he's just super like you. powerful. Project. Yeah, he could he could bench press like 5,000 pounds. And, or, and Typhon, Typhon's a pretty... Important uh, 
the I don't know what, what's important. the right word. I mean, the one of yeah. the all pervading, uh, what what would you even call it? Monster, demon, whatever archetype right. it has, right? And see how he's got legs made out of snakes. Yeah. So look at Ophiuchus carefully, directly below Hercules. Yeah. See how Ophiuchus is a, a central body with two serpents on either side, and then two legs at the bottom. Yep. Okay. He, Ophiuchus means serpent holder. So Ophiuchus shows up in myth in many different guises, but put your fingers over the bottom, put your finger over the bottom legs and just look at the central body. And then you've got a serpent coming out to the left and a serpent coming out to the right. Yeah. That's the serpent legs of Typhon. Typhon is associated with Ophiuchus. I'm pretty convinced because Hercules actually finally deals with Typhon. He can't completely destroy Typhon. He throws thunderbolts at Typhon. He can wound Typhon and drive him back, but he can't completely slay him. So he slams. You know how he deals with him? I can't he slams remember. a mountain down on top of him. Wow. In, in some, uh, some traditions, it's Mount Etna, which is still a volcano in, in Italy today. So he slams Mount Etna down on top of Typhon. And that's, you can see Ophiuchus sometimes plays a mountain in different myths. So anyway, but if you, if you look at Ophiuchus, you can realize why it's a figure with two snakes for legs, just like the image of Starbucks. If you go to Starbucks, you see the, uh, the siren, the, mer the mermaid or the siren, and she's got two fishy uh, tails coming up, just like Typhon here, hmm. because she's associated with Ophiuchus. I would argue she's associated with Ophiuchus. This is another uh, figure who's associated with Hercules. That's, you know who that is? No. Hanuman. Hanuman from hmm. ancient India. They're still worshipped in India. From the ancient Sanskrit texts of India. The, the god Hanuman is, I am convinced, associated with the constellation Hercules. You can see what's Hanuman's chosen weapon. A huge mace. Oh, I was, I was looking at the rock. Yeah, so he's picking up a rock with his other hand. So he's got a mace in one hand, and he's picking up a mountain in the other hand. Ophiuchus, like I said, is plays the role of a mountain. In this one particular myth, Hanuman has to save somebody's life, and he's told, uh, hey, the only way to save this, this person uh, is to get this herb that grows on in the mountains of the Himalayas. You've got to go get this herb and Hanuman gets there and he's looking around and he's like, I'm not sure which herb it is. Okay. I'll bring the whole mountain. So he brings the whole mountain. Well, that myth, you can see Hercules figures are above a mountain. He's leaning down and picking up either the triangular top of Ophiuchus or that little serpent head of Ophiuchus, the little smaller triangle there. You see that? Yeah. This is a picture of, uh, this is a gate in India, this is carved in the 1500s, but this is a figure whose name is Beam in the Sanskrit myths. He's got a big mace, but you can see how he's in that exact same uh, posture of Hercules. Beam is kind of a Hercules figure, Bhima. It's spelled Bhima, B-H-I-M-A. They usually pronounce it Beam, but you can see how it's connected to the Hercules figures across different cultures are often connected to the same kind of characteristics. They're usually jovial, they're pretty uh, fun-loving, they love to eat and party, but they have a quick temper, all these same kinds of things. And you can see he's holding up a lotus flower in one hand. That's because that part of Ophiuchus sometimes plays a lotus flower. Sometimes actually a lotus flower coming out of the belly button of an Ophiuchus figure. In fact, this is a this is a uh, this is a picture of Vishnu churning the ocean of milk. Vishnu is associated with Ophiuchus. Uh, Vishnu has a, 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 a lotus coming out of his navel in some of the ancient Sanskrit texts. And you can see above there, above Vishnu is another deity. That's Indra. That's associated with Indra. And Indra is the god who carries the thunderbolt in ancient India in the Sanskrit texts. And Indra, again, is associated with Hercules. So Hercules figures usually have the thunderbolt. Can you see how Indra is depicted in the outline of Hercules? Yep. 
Same thing with the back leg and yeah. Yeah, and actually if you look closely, all these dancing figures, both on the left and the right, I'm not even sure if they're male figures or female figures. They look like they're probably female figures because they have breasts, bare breasts, but they might be, they're like, uh, they're like um, angels or devas in, uh, there are many different, there's Gandharvas, there's many different uh, classes of celestial beings in the Sanskrit epics. But you can see they have a crown on their head. Just make note of that crown. It's important because there's a crown next to Hercules too. But you see they're in that same posture too. Uh, Thor is associated with uh, Hercules. Here's a god from Africa. His name is Shango or Shango. He's also a thunder god. So Thor is a thunder god. Shango is a thunder god. Zeus, Zeus is obviously, yes, a thunder god. So Zeus has a hammer. Uh, Zeus has a thunderbolt. Indra has a thunderbolt. Sometimes it's called the Vajra. Um, Shango has an axe, but they're all related to the, the constellation outline. Here's from the Americas. This is from a Maya text. You see how that figure there looks like he's holding a thunderbolt? This is from a Maya codex, the oldest known Maya codex. Um, look at the similarities to Zeus. Except he's facing yeah. the wrong way. Is that from the center? Yeah, okay, he's facing the wrong way. But still, it's they they sometimes the Greek paintings are facing the other way too. They uh they actually take kind of artistic license, but you can see they're still using that same um, Hercules outline, and the thunderbolt is associated with Hercules figures. Would you agree? Yeah, it makes sense because the thunderbolt. I mean that triangle or that. Uh, Weird yeah, shape above weapon, there. It could, yeah, right. it looks like it could be like either a hammer or a thunderbolt or. Yeah. It could be. It yeah. could play a club. Yeah. Like Hercules' favorite weapon is usually a club. Yeah. Now here's a really interesting one. This is from the the, it's called the the Gate of the Sun or the Puerta del Sol. That's what we call it today. It's from Tiwanaku in Bolivia. We don't know what the ancient people who built this called it, but look at that figure and look at the figures all, all around. I would argue that that is an Ophiuchus figure, this pattern of holding two serpents or two objects on either side. And then all around him are these little flying figures that are in the Hercules posture. You see how those are those two constellations? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That is from an ancient monument at Tiwanaku. We don't even know, you know who built it. Uh, it's maybe it was Inca, maybe it was Toltec or Olmec, but this ancient culture in the Americas is using this same system that's found around the world. And they seem to be it's, highlighting Ophiuchus or whatever his name is there. Do you think that's for a specific reason? Ophiuchus is the gate. Ophiuchus is the portal. So this is on the gate of the sun. I'll go back. Let Jeez. me see if I can... Ophiuchus is the gate. And so Ophiuchus is our connection to the divine realm. I talk about that in my latest book. So Zeus figures are in the divine realm. Ophiuchus figures often connect us to the divine realm. That's our gate to, to connect to the divine realm. So Ophiuchus is super important. Um, what I'm highlighting here is the some of the other constellations around Hercules. There's Hercules there. And can you see the northern crown? It's right next to Hercules. I just labeled it. Yep. Right there. You can see that tonight. And we'll see that when we go to Bryce Canyon. We'll see Hercules. We'll see Ophiuchus. Well, Hercules figures are sometimes envisioned as reaching out and grasping the northern crown. Or remember, we saw in that carving from India, sometimes there's uh, Hercules figures that are depicted as wearing a crown. Well, this this uh, idea of grasping something that's curved like that actually shows up. This is a, a Bible story from the uh, book of Kings, first Kings. This is the famous judgment of Solomon. I don't know if I've shown it to you guys before. No, I don't think so. Can you see anyone who's holding a sword kind of over his back, like a strong Hercules kind of figure? Yeah, the guy on his right there. Yeah. 
Yeah. So this is the story of the judgment of Solomon, where Solomon's wisdom is is shown. These two women have two babies at the same time. Once again, we have a, a two babies being born at the same time, but one of the babies dies and one of the babies lives. Similar pattern to what we were talking about. Can you see the dead baby down on the ground? Yeah. Okay. And they're actually, they're two harlots in the Bible, or two prostitutes. Uh, they both get pregnant at the same time. And one of them overlays the baby and the baby dies. And then, um, so they come before the king and one of them says, oh, king, uh, she switched babies on me. My baby was born, her baby was born about the same time. Then she actually accidentally uh, overlay the baby, slept on the baby, baby died. And then she switched with mine. And that's, she gave me the dead one and she took my baby. And, and the other one says, no, 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 that's not true. I didn't do that. She's trying to trick you, O king. This, the dead baby is hers. The live baby is mine. And Solomon says, hmm, this is a dilemma. How do I know whose baby is whose? So he says, I've got an idea. Take the live baby, cut it in half, give one half to each of them, solves the problem. <laughs> and immediately one of the women yells out, oh, no, 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 give it to her. I don't care. Please don't kill that baby. And the other one says, oh, no, I think you should. Cut it up. Now, that's irrational, right? <laughs> the one who was trying to get the baby, who had lied about it, says, no, I want you to cut it in half anyway. Now, just a minute ago, she was trying to keep the baby as a live baby. So it doesn't even, it's, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor about the, the same thing we were talking about, the higher self and the lower self, the, the dead baby, the live baby, the, the egoic mind and the divine mind. But th this is, Solomon immediately says, stop, don't cut the baby in half. That was just a trick. Give it to her, <laughs> the, one, the one who said, the one who said, don't kill it, that's obviously the mother, uh, give it to her. So, and that's in uh, 1 Kings 3, chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 16 and following there. Hmm. But you, can you see how the, in, in the text itself, Solomon says, cut the baby in half. It's not, when I was a kid, I thought it was Solomon wielding the sword. It's not Solomon wielding the sword. He's telling someone to wield the sword. You see the, how the baby is arched right yep. there? It's hard arch. In these myths, a Hercules figure will often pick up a baby. And the baby is the northern crown. Now, that doesn't just jump out at you as a baby, but it's found around the world this way, which is an argument for this system is connected. This is not like, uh, uh, this is not something that just pops up um randomly in different cultures all by itself i believe there's an ancient worldwide system that is remembered by all these different cultures around the world here's another depiction of the judgment of solomon solomon saying hold on don't cut it in half see once again we have the the swordsman putting the sword over his back and the baby once again depicted in an arch oh yeah and huh. solomon solomon is often depicted he's described as being between the pillars of the temple. Um, oh, I jumped ahead a little bit, but Solomon is a different constellation. He's not Hercules, okay? But I just wanna show real quick, and I know we're, we're I'm not giving you guys a lot of time to ask questions. No, no, it's okay. Constellations, sometimes I get this uh, response. Well, of course, all the myths around the world are based on the stars because you can see the stars around the world, right? Yep. Which you can. But the constellation Hercules is not an obvious constellation. And even when you know how to find the constellation Hercules, to imagine the northern crown as a baby is not particularly obvious. I mean, we, we already saw the northern crown, right? And yet... We see it here as a baby. We see it in the myths of Maui. Maui is thrown into the uh, ocean foam by his parents, and uh, he's rescued by his powerful grandfather, who picks him up and hangs him in the rafters over the fire to dry out because he's freezing cold from being thrown into the ocean. That's the same pattern. The grandfather is Hercules. The baby, Maui in this case, who's being lifted up to the rafters, 
is in that case the the constellation uh, Corona Borealis, Northern Crown, same word that we use for coronavirus right now, which you see that in these kind of traumatic operations. I think that there are people who are using uh, the ancient knowledge to inflict trauma instead of to help us to uh, overcome trauma. But mm. it's not an obvious thing to see the baby, to see the Northern Crown, Corona Borealis, as a baby. And yet we find it around the world. We find it in the Bible. We also find it in the uh, the book of Revelation, not not only in the book of First Kings, which is in the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament. We also find it in the Revelation, the Greek scriptures of the New Testament. We find it in the myths of Maui. It is not obvious. And even here's a depiction of the constellation Hercules from the 1800s. Notice that this artist, the artist's name is Sidney Hall. You can find this this is from a, a famous book of the constellations. It was actually flashcards of the constellations made in the early 1800s, I think the 1820s, wow. maybe the 1840s. Well, you can see they've got the posture of Hercules, right? He's got the deep knee bend, right? He's got the club over his head, right? Yeah. But they've got it wrong because you see the crown? It's on the other There's side. The yeah. They've got it upside down. They, the, the, the outline of Hercules is understood, but in this, in this uh, set of cards that they made in the 1800s, they've actually outlined Hercules upside down. The northern crown is over there. Yeah, yeah. This is the outline of Hercules. I just, I just drew it. Yeah. That's not, that's not part of the card series. I drew that in. That's the way Hercules is in that deep knee bend. But it's not so obvious. It's, it's so not obvious that they didn't even get it right. They knew that it's supposed to be that way because of somehow the traditions get passed down. Artists, even you know those paintings that I showed you of Judgment of Solomon, those aren't ancient. That's getting passed down through the ages to depict these figures in these postures. And, and here's another clue, the star Vega, that's a very bright star. You see the star Vega is over on that side. So they've clearly got Hercules drawn upside down. Yeah, <clears throat> interesting. So. So that, that defeats the argument of, oh, it'd be so obvious that all these different cultures, they just come up with the same myths uh, because they're looking at the same stars. Right. They're using the same system. It's an ancient system, but somehow the system has been lost, possibly because of a cataclysm like Randall talks about or other people like Robert Schock talk about. This system was already in place during the time of the ancient Egyptians, during the time of ancient Mesopotamia. We could show it from the Gilgamesh and from other Sumerian myths. It was already in place in the ancient India Vedas, ancient China. It was in place in the most ancient civilizations we know about, the ancient Maya, the Toltecs, the whoever built Tiwanaku. It was already worldwide at the time of the most ancient civilizations. What does that tell you? It probably came from something even earlier. Yeah. Probably much earlier. Yeah. So, um, but it's but it but it's apparently one of its main purposes is to help us to reconnect with our higher self and through that reconnect with the realm of the gods, the realm of our pure potential or our 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 potential. So I've talked a lot. I'll let you guys ask questions i'll unshare the screen if you want well you mentioned you mentioned a, a couple times there about about them using instead of using myths to heal you're they're using myths to traumatize us right now so have, after looking at all this and bringing out this book in 2020 about trauma and with everything that's going on right now i mean can you can you is there any examples you have of them using symbolism yeah. or mythology to to traumatize us yeah and you can think of some too without much Without much uh, prompting, you well, can think I mean, of them. Well, I'll, there's the I'll, whole I'll masking. There's the whole esoteric part of masking people. I mean, that's one thing. But I don't know what I don't. I I see these things contemporarily, but I don't have enough knowledge of the myths to to correlate them to any kind of esoteric yeah. symbology. Or anything well, let like me that. get into it. let me get into it just briefly. I do get into it in the book. So oh, okay, wow. I do get into it in the book, which you you guys are getting, but. This is another painting of the uh, Judgment of Solomon. You can see the uh, dead baby in yeah. one, one of his arms and the live baby is again arching. Look at Solomon in this case. He's got some hand gestures. So these hand gestures tie into constellations, by the way. Um, you see that at, like in the uh, Last Supper uh, painting. But you see that Solomon is very often associated with the two pillars of the temple. 
You see the two pillars yep. there? The two pillars with Solomon in between. Two pillars with Solomon in between. So this is a famous screenshot from a BBC broadcast from what? Before Tower 7 went down, talking about Tower Correct. 7. So how many towers went down in the World Trade Center Three. attacks? Three towers. Two towers with oh. the Solomon <laughs> Brothers building in between. Oh. The 47-story Solomon Brothers building is right behind her. She's saying that it's collapsed. She's a half an hour early. Somehow she's been told, hey, you got to announce that the Solomon Brothers building is going down. Building 7 is which also is, known as Which is weird that Solomon they would make Brothers that mistake. Building. I mean, that, I, that to me is... It's mad. weird unless you're putting it in your face. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. L listen, what have we been talking about with trauma? What is trauma? What is trauma? You have to disconnect from what you're the rest of you is telling you, your goal of mind that is your defense mechanism, this egoic mind that keeps you alive, believes it's keeping you alive. It's like, I saved us. I got us through all that. It doesn't want to let go. You've got a much wider consciousness than your consciousness, uh, than your, your goal of egoic mind. You've got, you've got a gut, you've got a higher self that's telling you stuff with through synchronicity sometimes through yeah. messages through dreams yeah. through it's intuition yeah. and yet our world causes us to divide from that if your gut is telling you if you watch those buildings come down and then you're told they came down because of fires that were caused by planes and yet and your your egoic mind goes yes i believe that deep down in your heart, deep down in your gut, there's parts of you that are very, very wise that are picking up on all kinds of signals that you're not picking up on. That's going, that is complete bullshit. That is not what caused those towers to come down, especially building seven. Yeah. Some, some, some office fire didn't bring down a 47 story steel frame building yeah. into its footprint at free fall speed or at speeds that are indistinguishable from free fall. So anyone who sees that deep down knows but you suppress that because if you go to work and start talking about it you're going to get cut off from your source of livelihood just like that quotation i gave you i don't know if dr mate agrees with a single thing that i say so please don't please don't uh misinterpret this as me saying that he supports my, my no, interpretations no, of things all. but he said that as a child you must have nurturing from your parents so you will suppress parts of yourself you will disconnect because you cannot get you must get that nourishment well we do the same thing we cannot nobody can completely disconnect from society if you go try and live in solitary confinement it'll be very hard on you if you live on an island for 30 years all by yourself the minute somebody shows up you'll you'll be hugging them and dancing we are social animals, so we cannot uh, uh, just run around talking about what we know. Our, our egoic mind has been created all through middle school, all through elementary school to protect us from uh, being completely excluded and shunned. And well, so we divide from ourselves. And that I think what's going on is you've got some people who have woken up to this and are starting to run around looking for all these symbols and like, aha, aha. And then you have some people who are suppressing it. But yeah. in both cases, it's traumatizing. Yeah, it's also traumatizing to be stuck inside your house too and not to and to social distance. Absolutely. I mean, this is a whole other other part of the trauma that you just talked about. About you can't, you know, you talked about isolation. Well, they're actually forcing people to do that now. Absolutely. And, and so, and, and then when they do it with symbolism, look, the two towers and the Solomon Brothers building. Yeah, wow. That is a, and, and in the book, I talk about um, the, the, there's, these patterns are used to, to where people go, ooh, I'm starting to look for those patterns. It's almost an initiation, okay? It's almost an initiation, but it's not an initiation into reconnecting with your higher self it's more of an initiation into oh my goodness the these all-powerful uh you know 
I, I use the terms from like the military. Like, I, you know, I, I was in the military. I went to West Point. They call it the cadre or the drill instructors. If you're going through basic training, you're getting an initiation. If you go to basic training, you get an initiation. If you go to West Point, you get an initiation. And guess what? It's traumatic. Yeah. <laughs> and the cadre or the drill instructors, the, the ones who are at the top of the pyramid are, it's almost like they're gods in your eyes. So you're getting an initiation, but it's not an initiation into uh, I'm connected to my higher self. I'm so powerful. It's more of an initiation into ah the the people above me are so powerful they can do anything. That's <laughs> that's the kind of that's the kind of effect that I think they're going for by putting this stuff in your face. That's some people yeah. some people are some people suppress it, and that's traumatic. It's just like if your wife, I use this. Uh, metaphor i heard it from someone else actually who said if your wife is cheating on you you'll actually know it deep inside before your brain admits it mm. or if your girlfriend your significant other because your your uh your your most um i'm trying to stop share here your most deepest all, Intu all, intuition yeah intuition your subconscious knows it but your your golem mind your egoic mind that's trying to protect you and i know we're running out of time keeps you from knowing it. and then eventually when you know reality crashes in maybe you, your egoic mind finally has to deal with it but that being separated from what you know that's what that's what's happening i think with some of these traumatic events where it's so blatant and and you're looking at it and going how is anyone believing that that event is really what they're telling it yeah, yeah. as? Yeah. Well, I think there's a lot of people who are realizing that subconsciously, but they're suppressing it and that's unhealthy. So we've got, we're creating more and more of a traumatic society because it's easier to oppress people when they're split from who they are. If you're a integrated with who you are, you're completely like you were raised in that environment that we were talking about earlier, where you know exactly who you, you know, you're, you're part of your tribe. Your dad was always showing you things. You don't feel self-conscious of the way you dress or the way you talk. You're, you're hanging out with lots of other kids, your age, you're learning to hunt. You're learning to read the leaves of this kind of plant and that kind of plant. You're going to be a lot more of a, a dignified, connected, powerful kind of an individual and uh than if you're obliterated and so when whenever literalist christianity goes somewhere to try and expand its empire it immediately starts stamping out all the ancient knowledge that was there saying you can't you can't you can't listen to those myths they're demonic and you can't talk in your language we're going to put you in this school where you talk in this language and we're going to divide you from your culture on purpose because uh, it, it's, it's an attempt to obliterate that cohesion and that power. And actually, we're in a culture where every single one of us, the, you know, your ancestors were not literalist Christians. No, nobody's was. Every, that was. That was in place onto, onto every, everybody's ancestors at some point whether you're from Europe or from Africa or from Asia or from the Americas, that was not an original set of myths that was given to people. It was built on ancient stuff. I'm not saying that the Bible cannot help you. It can. It's, it's wonderful. But the system that was put on top of it is often traumatizing. So, And that's why so many people, I think, are so hungry for, oh, I want to go learn the myths of India or I want to learn the sacred traditions of the Native American sacred traditions. They're hungry for that because they're like, I want to get back to that. I want to get integrated with my authentic self somehow. And they, and they see that as a path to do it, which it is a path to do it. So do you think there's a risk that with all this overt symbolism and hypocrisy that they will overstep or overshoot the mark and a whole bunch of people will wake up that they don't expect? I mean, isn't it going to take only a certain amount of people like the hundredth monkey kind of thing before everybody realizes, Oh my God, like, I hope a lot of people wake up to it. Know. I, I, I absolutely think that the, the people are more powerful than the small group, <laughs> right? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's inflicting trauma on people. 
And that's why they have to use deception. <laughs> if you're more powerful, you don't have to use deception. Yeah, yeah. So I hope that people will wake up. And, and I think that getting in touch, getting reconnected with your own self is, is a really important first step. But I th that's why I put both in this book. And, you know, it, it's, a, it's a lot to try and hold together in one book, but I felt like it was important to have both those aspects, the reconnecting with yourself, but also realizing what's going on on a societal level. Because I think we're getting to a point where we really need, it's getting very dangerous. This, this whole lockdown, I mean, um, we can all see that something is going on beyond what we're being told. Okay. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, put down yeah, people yeah, who are yeah. wearing masks yeah. or people who aren't wearing masks. Like if you're on a native American reservation where there's really bad outbreaks of COVID uh, wearing a mask might be the right thing to do. I saw a picture of Superman today with a mask. I'm not going to insult yeah, that, yeah. you know, yeah. um, uh, but we can see that something is going on that is manipulation. I mean, there's no, there's no doubt in your mind when they're sending sick people to nursing homes, you're like, what in, on earth are they doing? Are they trying to kill more people? What there is like, it doesn't compute unless there's something else going on. And I don't think there's anybody listening who, uh, who wouldn't agree that there's something more going on. Yeah. Well, why are they doing it? It could be to be increasing, uh, technological surveillance of everybody kinds of things that nobody would have accepted a year ago. Yeah. yeah. Now we're going to trace wherever you go and people say, Oh, thank you. As long as I can get on an airplane and now we're going to fly drones above cities, you know, to, to monitor, uh, any gathering, you know, Oh yeah, I think we need to do that. Uh, ushering in, ushering in AI to, uh, do more facial recognition. I don't know exactly what's going on, but the 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 capabilities to impose greater austerity on people are increasing. And I think the imposition of austerity, I talk about this in the book too, we don't have time to really get into it, but austerity basically means higher taxes and lower services. Yeah. <laughs> you get yeah. less and you pay more. Yeah. And it's not always government taxes, in fact, it's a lot of times it's private tax, like a tax that's imposed by the bank, a tax that's imposed by the corporation, yeah, yeah. Pri private equity buying up all the parking meters in a city. This is actually happening where cities are broke and bankrupt and they have to sell off the roads to some Wall Street investor who says, oh, yeah, I'd love to get all the quarters or all the parking tolls. We're not going to use quarters anymore. You're going to use your credit card, but that's a private tax. It's going into a private billionaire's pocket instead of going to, you know, the government that's supposed to be of the people, by the people, for the people. Yeah. Um, anyway, a private tax. So that's austerity. So that's what I think is being imposed. Uh, so I think we better wake up to well, I answer think, to your question. And I think part of the, the lesson here probably would be, especially with you, your book and, <clears throat> and the other people we've talked to is, to try and try and get to that point where you're you can bring out your authentic self and and then i think that the truth is more discernible it's easier it's easier it's easier discernible how do i say it yeah it's more easily discernible i think if you're in or your authentic easily discerned. self i mean yeah, I, I really totally do agree. i really do I, believe I that, that th there's a, i think there's we're a, on that journey yeah, i yeah. totally agree with you I, and i'm not saying oh i'm you know look at me i'm totally in touch with my higher self, but I do see like this authentic self part of me has been leading me on this journey. Cause this is all this stuff that I just talked about is not something I was looking at, yeah. looking for yeah. when I was in the army or even yeah. when I got out of the army, I was taking the Bible. Literally I was a literalist Christian, but something started moving me down this path. Yeah. So yeah. I totally agree that, that we, uh, we will discern more the more we get in touch. Like yeah. And I, said. and I don't, and I think you're pretty open. You say that you don't, you don't necessarily know the truth and I don't think we do either. I'm not saying that we know the truth, but maybe, you know, what's not true. You know, maybe that's the way to look at it as discernible, discerning the lies as opposed to, you know, knowing the truth. Yeah. There's a totally. big difference. And seeing there. patterns yeah. and seeing these patterns, like this book came out in April before some of the crazy stuff that happened in May, but those patterns, a lot of these patterns, you, you've probably seen some of my videos talking about what is this pattern of cross legs with this guy who got pushed down yeah. in Buffalo. And by the way, 
there's an obelisk right over here or an obelisk and oh look at this building two towers with a thing you know yeah. you see this the pattern of greater austerity has been going on for a long time since the middle ages really yeah. so yeah. that what, this book hopefully will help people see patterns which looking at constellations is seeing patterns yeah so that's right on well right on dave fun. we can't wait to look at some patterns with you and i guess what would only be really like five months from now four months from now we're gonna see and we're gonna see a couple times you yeah, know what really i was thinking is four why months. don't you just come up here come up here <laughs> early and i'll take you and we can scope out some of those uh spots before we drive down for to, to washington to washington hey let me uh let me consult with my higher self on that one and chew it over. That's a great idea. I think consult that's with your wife too. <laughs> that's an inspired <laughs> idea that you got from from while you while you were uh, listening, while you were chewing on all this stuff. Yeah, I definitely better consult with my wife. <laughs> um, thanks for that invitation. Thanks for having me to Grime America. Yeah, thanks. Buddy. Thanks to everybody who's listened, and thanks for everyone who's interested in these subjects. I think. Uh, I feel they're really important, and I really uh, hope hope that uh, it's beneficial to others. Right on, buddy. Yeah, so do we. We'll put all your links in the show notes and everything, and uh, yeah, we'll keep in touch. We can't wait to get the book. Should be here. I I predict it'll be here tomorrow. <laughs> right on. Yeah. Okay, Thanks, Dave. Everybody. Yeah, take a picture when you get it. <laughs> yeah, we will. Yeah, for sure. We'll post it on our social medias and try and sell some books for you. And who knows, you, maybe gentlemen. we'll get you actually in Grimerica Studios this year. That would be awesome. Thank you, Grimericans right, everywhere. <laughs> okay, Bye. Dave. See you, buddy. Bye-bye. Night. And that was our chat with the fabulous Dave Matheson. Um... Yeah, that was good. I didn't think. Yeah, I think it was. Uh, it was good that it wasn't all about the stars. You know, there's some other myths in there. And and you know what's weird is I've learned so much about mythology and and uh, symbolism since we've had him on. Last. We've had him on f he, so, four or five times now. Yeah, but I mean, but every time budget. I learn, I learn more every time we talk. You know, it's it's good That's between the, the time we talk. Yeah, I was gonna make some comment about you. You mentioned something about. Uh, I was going to say, well, you are in it now. You're in the esoteric secret organization. The thick of it. I'm in the secret, yeah, esoteric yeah, yeah. secret sky alien organizations. Actually, we're on summer break. Well, you have <laughs> summer break in July 4th. We had, we had COVID first, so we took a break for that, and then we have summer break, and we only meet once a month. So we're like, Can't uh, you guys engineer us like, out of this thing? We're like, like a, yeah. the laziest guys... faction of Masons in the world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought maybe you'd be able to help us out I think of this thing. At the end of the we'll have end, at the end of the year we'll have ended up meeting like four times this year. What does all your masons think about the esoteric I symbolism to him. of, of, I of masking talked, and I haven't talked to him and, since uh, February. Social distancing. <laughs> I haven't talked to him since February. Wow. March? Do we have a March, meeting in March? Yeah, I think it was later than that. March. Maybe really it was March. Event. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Everything shut so down. So you don't have Zoom meetings or anything like that? Nah, Why nah, don't you they, start up the Zoom they've meetings? They've been trying again? to get me into the Zoom meetings, <laughs> and I'm just like, it. I'm you not doing go? it. Nah. So there you go. Don't feel bad when I miss your Zoom stuff or when I'm like, because it's like, they're like, they the last one they were even like, we just like, please like everyone to make an effort. And I was even home, but I'm just like, I know. I know this is the last hard. thing I'm going to do is like spend three hours on Zoom with you guys. Like, it's just, I'm sorry. You might like it. It might be one of those things you would enjoy it and you'll like it more. I'm sure, but I enjoyed doing other things. Yeah. Other than sitting in front of a computer. Yeah. Well, like if it's out and going out and sitting around with people, you know, that's more. Yeah. But I'm not into the meeting over Zoom thing. You know, like I've been meeting people over Zoom for like the better part of a decade now, yeah. like crazy. And I mean, you know, yeah. I don't want to do it in my spare time too. Unless, uh, I mean, if I was actually locked in my house or in some sort of lockdown that I couldn't just subvert. I have to run a Zoom meeting tomorrow with a meditation and everything. Yeah, I mean, so. you're a Zoom guy. I mean, they should, between your Dungeons and Dragons and your recovery, Dharma. recovery meetings and your <laughs> podcasting, you just like, you live on Zoom most of the time. Yeah. Well, big thanks to uh, our buddy Dave Matheson for coming on the show again, sending us a book. 
being a wonderful human being. Of course, Dave is a good friend of mine. I'm texting with Dave at least on a weekly basis, if not more. A um, bit of a mentor to me. And, uh, yeah, just a fabulous cat. Of course, maybe we will definitely see him twice this year, maybe even three times. Maybe we'll sneak him into the studio, take him out to the bush, show him some mountains and shit, show him where we'll camp out, uh, maybe do some sea setting. C5. What's the difference? We, told, we talked about this branding. Right? Branding. Well, we need some Grimerica branded C5. <laughs> I don't know. No, it's okay. GE5. We're not really doing it much, so Graham we'll encounters. <laughs> Guaranteed to encounter Graham. Close encounter. If you pay Graham. extra, you can have a close encounter with Graham. <laughs> that costs extra. You can have an overnighter. It's even more. Uh, actually, there is. Uh, get in touch with me if you want to go to the Dave Matheson event because uh, there's some moving parts right now. I can't guarantee you there's some stuff left. As of right now, I think there is. By the time this comes out, there might not be. But there is some moving parts with COVID and the reschedule. Some people are, you know, maybe trying to resell or can't make it with the new dates. I've got to take a close look at it, but there might be a spot or two left. So shoot me an email, darrenackeramerica.com, and I'll let you know where you fit there. Uh, you can definitely squeeze, try and get in on the second week of Randall Carlson there. Dave Matheson won't be at the second week. But uh, I think Brandon Powell will end up being at the second week. But shoot me an email there too, darrenackeramerica.com. Actually, I think you can actually just buy tickets for that one at, uh, at contact at thecabin.com slash Carlson. Uh, check out the show notes. Do all the stuff in there that we ask you to. There's a honey doobie doobie do list. That would be just fucking fabulous if you could do it. And uh, I don't know if you guys are getting a little value from the podcast. We think you are. Uh, I like to think you are. There's at least a few hundred of you that are getting some value from the podcast and sending a little value back our way over at America.ca slash support. I think this will be like episode 430-something. So I don't know. you got 430-some podcasts. They're all like an hour too long. What kind of value does that add to your life? Is it better than your cable? Is it worse than your cable? Maybe. I don't know. We don't know where it fits. Is it better than your morning coffee? I don't know. America.ca slash support. You decide what value the podcast add to your life. Throw a little value back our way. I mean, we are kind of just sort of looking at the at the writing on the wall, and it seems to be just a matter of time until we get canceled from some of these platforms. So we are in the background trying to set up all of our own infrastructure, uh, working on some Mastodon stuff. We're working with uh, some of the guys over at the Union of the Unwanted and OBDM to try and get some stuff going in the background so that we are cancel-proof, trying to make that happen. For America.ca slash support, we can't uh, do any of that sort of stuff without uh, supporters like you. We love you. Sign up today. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. All right, you Thanks motherfuckers. Thanks, everybody, for uh, checking us tuning out live. live. Yeah. Everybody see who's you. tuning in live, join see the chats. See you next week. America.ca slash chats. We'll be back next Tuesday with a friend of the show, Alex DeCaris, coming back with his new book about evil. Should be a fun chat. Of course, uh, Alex is a fabulous human being, friend of the show. And, you know, there'll be like three guys in a row that are like a background friends of the show. Yeah. Be fun. Some inside baseball. All right, guys. We've been here for like five or six hours, so we're fucking out of here. Our, we burned our dinner while we were podcasting. <laughs> All right, guys. We'll see you uh, in like 